So let's take a certain sequence of DNA, a gene specifically, and transcribe it to make its corresponding RNA sequence. And then watch as that RNA gets processed into a messenger RNA, which then leaves the nucleus and floats out to the cytoplasm of a cell. What is the next step that has to occur to get the fully functional protein that the original gene coded for? Well, that next step is translation, which is the process by which messenger RNA, or mRNA, produced by transcription is decoded by ribosome complex to produce a specific amino acid chain, or polypeptide, that will later fold into an active protein. Now, in bacteria, translation occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell on free-floating ribosomes. And in eukaryotes, like humans, translation occurs across the membrane of an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosome is the machinery that facilitates decoding of the mRNA and construction of the corresponding polypeptide chain. Now, in prokaryotes, there are ribosomes that are 70S in size, each consisting of a small 30S subunit and a large 50S subunit. And in eukaryotes, they have 80S ribosomes, each consisting of a small 40S and a large 60S subunit. Now, the unit of measurement for ribosomes is the Svedberg unit, that's what the S stands for, which is a measure of the rate of sedimentation in centrifugation rather than size. And so this accounts for why the fragment names here don't really add up to what the total ribosome is. Now, translation occurs in three distinct steps, the first of which is initiation. Initiation of translation involves the assembly of the components of the entire translation system, which are the small and large ribosomal subunits. So here is the small subunit, and here is the large subunit. It also includes the messenger RNA to be translated, a tRNA or transfer RNA with an amino acyl group or amino acid attached, GTP as the major source of energy, as well as initiation factors, or I'll just put down IFs, which help the assembly of this whole initiation complex. Now the ribosome has three sites the active or A site, the peptidyl or P site, and the exit or E site. The A site is the point of entry for the amino acyl tRNA. So I'll draw that out here. And this is with the exception of the very first amino acyl tRNA, which has methionine, which actually enters at the P site. Now the P site is where the peptidyl tRNA is formed in the ribosome, as you can see here. So. Here's the P site. And the E site is the exit site where the now uncharged tRNA exits after its amino acid has been added to the growing peptide chain. Now, translation begins at the initiation site of the mRNA sequence, which is usually an AUG codon. That is the start codon. So here you can see the codons in the messenger RNA, which are red in groups of three. And so you can imagine that this is translation already in process. And so the mRNA is being processed going in this direction. And so the start codon would have been somewhere down here on this end of the messenger RNA. Now in prokaryotes um, specifically, the 30S subunit binds to the mRNA template at this purine rich region known as the shine dalgarno sequence, which is upstream from the AUG initiation codon. And so going back to our messenger RNA, this end of the messenger RNA would be considered upstream and this end is considered downstream. The shine dalgarno sequence is complementary to a pyrimidine rich region on the 16S ribosomal RNA component of the 30S subunit in prokaryotes. And during the formation of the initiation complex, these complementary nucleotide sequences pair up to form a double-stranded RNA structure that binds the mRNA to the ribosome in such a way that the initiation codon, the AUG codon, is placed at the P site. Now, the second step in translation is elongation. During chain elongation, each additional amino acid is added to the nascent polypeptide chain in a three-step microcycle. The steps in this little cycle are, first, the positioning of the correct amino acyl tRNA in the A site of the ribosome. 
seen here, the formation of the peptide bond in the P site, and the shifting of the mRNA by one codon relative to the ribosome. So let's take a look at elongation in action. Here you can see the transfer RNA or tRNA that has the matching anticodon to the codon in the messenger RNA. And that specific tRNA is bringing in the correct amino acid to be placed. And it's coming into the A or active site here. Now in the active site and in the P or peptidyl site, you can see that there are two tRNAs with the anticodons that match the, the codons in the mRNA. And in the P site, you can see the growing polypeptide chain still bound to this tRNA. And here you can already see the formation of the peptide bond with the newest amino acid that's been added. And here you can kind of see this would be considered the E site or exit site which has the outgoing tRNA that's already unloaded its amino acid. So here is elongation in process. Here you can see in the P site is the corresponding transfer RNA with the correct anticodon matching the codon on the messenger RNA. And this tRNA in the P site has the growing polypeptide chain. In the A site is the newest transfer RNA to come into the ribosome with the correct corresponding amino acid to be added to this growing polypeptide chain. Once that transfer RNA is in place at the A site, a ribozyme in the large subunit catalyzes the formation of this newest peptide bond. And then the tRNA in the P site is then considered to be deacylated because it has transferred this growing polypeptide chain over to the tRNA in the A site with the formation of this newest bond here. Once this reaction occurs, everything shifts down one spot. So the tRNA in the P site then becomes the outgoing tRNA in the E site. The tRNA that was in the A site that now has the new polypeptide chain moves over to the P site and then it, the next incoming tRNA takes the place in the A site. Now the entire process is catalyzed by an enzyme called an elongation factor and the ribosome continues to translate the remaining codons on the messenger RNA as more amino acyl tRNAs bind to the A site until the ribosome reaches a stop codon. When, a, when the ribosome reaches a stop codon, then termination starts, which is the last step in translation. So termination occurs when one of the three termination codons moves into this A site. These codons aren't recognized by any of the transfer RNAs. Instead, they are recognized by proteins called release factors, namely release factor 1, which recognizes the UAA and the UAG stop codons, and then release factor 2, which recognizes the UAA and the UGA stop codons. These factors trigger the hydrolysis of the ester bond in the peptidyl tRNA and release the newly synthesized protein from the ribosome. A third release factor, RF3, catalyzes the release of release factor 1 and release factor 2 at the end of the termination process. Now, the post-termination complex formed by the end of the termination step consists of the mRNA with the termination codon at the A site, an uncharged tRNA in the P site, and the intact ribosome. So the post-termination complex formed at the end of the termination step consists of the mRNA with the termination codon at the A site, an uncharged tRNA in the P site, and the intact ribosome. Now, ribosome recycling is a step that's responsible for the disassembly of the post-termination ribosomal complex. And so once the nascent or new protein is released in termination, ribosome recycling factor and elongation factor function to release the mRNA and tRNAs from the ribosomes and to disassociate the ribosome itself into the small and large subunits. That way, all translational components are now free for additional rounds of translation.